ابن أبي العز الحنفي علي بن علي بن محمد بن أبي العز بن أبي العز الحنفي الدمشقي رحمه الله تعالى whose most famous book is what his his explanation of العقيدة الطحاوية شرح العقيدة الطحاوية one of his most famous teachers was Mm. This is not a lecture, by the way, it's class. His most famous teachers was? Exactly. <laughs> Ibn Kathir. <laughs> Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala. Who, who also wrote a very famous seerah book called what? Anybody know? Al Fusul, fi seerat al Rasul. Right? Chapters in the seerah and the biography of the Prophet. And most likely, this is a. This is a, uh, a shortening, a summary, right, of the fusul turned into poetry. Okay? طيب. So, uh, last week, we covered nine lines, I believe, of poetry. Inshallah, today we're going to get to line 19. Bidnillah, uh, we're going to make it to line 19 today. Bidnillah. But what I want you to memorize for next week is up to line 25. And by the way, uh, on the last class, there's a, we're having a competition. So whoever wins, bi'idnillah, and whoever memorized all hundred lines of the poetry, there's going to be a competition between you all, and the winner gets $300. For the children, and you should encourage the, those of you who have children here, for the children, each one that can do the 100 lines with, with five mistakes or less, they get a, there's not going to be a competition. No, you're not a child. See? I don't know if you didn't realize that, but that beard gives you away. Um, the chair gives you away, too. Technically, uh, you do, but you don't. You can't vote, can you? Khaira. <laughs> So I, I'm, I want to encourage the, the kids, they actually usually memorize quicker than the adults anyway. And um, because it's, uh, it's poetic, and it usually it's easier for them to memorize. Inshallah ta'ala. So today, I think that's that one. Okay. Alright, let's start over. You're still on, huh? Play. Inshallah khair. Okay, so before we get started, inshallah, what I'd like you to do, um, I want you to write some things down. Write this down. Zain al Abidin, Ibn Ali ibn al Hussein, Rahimahullah. Zain al Abidin ibn Ali ibn al Hussein. Hussein, what was his relationship to the Prophet? He was the grandson of the Prophet. Who was. Who was his parents? Who were his parents? Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima bint al Nabi Ali. Ali so, Zayn ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, We used to be taught, write this down, we used to be taught the maghazi of Allah, of the Quran. Kunna nu'allam. مغازي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كما نعلم السورة من القرآن. We used to be taught the magazi. يعني those are the, the battles of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. We used to be taught the magazi of Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم like we were taught a sura of the Quran. Quran. Right. Constant repetition. Okay. Making sure that they didn't make mistakes. Making sure that they understood everything. Right. This is how they were taught. Do you think they gave importance to the battles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. So, so that was the seerah back then. Not exactly. Not exactly. So al maghazi yes. It, what, it, so sometimes the, the, the term maghazi or the battles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
was language that was used to encompass more than just the battles, okay? But it's also because of the times that they lived in with the expansion. What he did during those battles, how the Muslims behaved was very important for them with the expansion of Islam. Let, let, let's go a step. We'll, we'll go take some more, inshallah. Ibn al Jawzi, write this down. Ibn al Jawzi, rahimahullah. He says in Sayyid al Khatir, which is translated into English, by the way, that book is, is huge. Captured Thoughts, I think it's called. He says, Wa aslu al usuli, wa aslu usuli al ilmi, wa anfa'u al ulumi, and nadaru fi siya rasuli al rasuli sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ashabihi. Qala Allahu ta'ala, ulaika ladina had Allah. Foundation of knowledge, write it down. The very foundation of knowledge and the most beneficial knowledge is looking at the lives of the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions. Allah said, those were the people whom Allah guided. So follow their guidance. So Surah Al-An'am, the sixth chapter in the Quran, the 90th ayah. Tayyip. He says that the foundation of knowledge and the most beneficial knowledge is looking at their lives. And that is because, as we've mentioned on several occasions, when you say in Surah Al-Fatiha, Ihdina as-sirat al-mustaqeen. What's that mean? Hmm. Guide us to the straight path. You can stop right there, and that's a great dua, right? Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. But Allah did not let that be sufficient for us. If you stop there, you don't have a, you don't have a salat. Because you need Surah Al-Fatiha for your salat to be valid. Right? Alhamdulillah. 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 Kids in the masjid is indicative of a new generation of Muslims. Well, alhamdulillah. It's a great thing. Alhamdulillah. Tayyip. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَ اللَّهِ فَبِهُدَىٰ نَعْمَ Ma'alish. Back to Surah Al-Fatiha. Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqeem. And then what do you say? Sirat al-Ladheena an'amta alayhim. So you're asking Allah to guide you to the straight path of what? The path of those whom you have favored. Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us here, don't just ask for guidance, but ask for guidance like those people who have been favored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their lives. See, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, if you just ask for guidance, then guidance becomes something that's theoretical. It's like, um, it's, it's just a path. It's just something that's in your mind. But once you ask the path of the role models that you follow, right? And who are, the, who are those Allah Azza wa Jalla described in Surah Tanisa, those whom he has favored? Who are they? And Nabiyin, the prophets, was Siddiqeen. The sincere and truthful. With shuhada, the martyrs. With salihin, the righteous. With hasuna ulaika, rafiqa. And they are those good companions to be with. Even if you don't physically live with them, they are your rufaqa. They are the ones that you want to be with. You want to walk their path. Everybody has a role model. Right? Your role model needs to be those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored. So Ibn al Josie here is saying the very foundation of knowledge, the most beneficial knowledge, is looking at the lives of the Prophet and his companions. Once you learn that, then you'll be able to follow guidance. It, you, you hear the Imam at, at the, uh, at when he's in Qunut, right? At the, uh, at the end of Taraweeh. What, what's, the, what's the beginning of Qunut? Allah Mahdina stop. Faladina and I'm ta'adihim. Guide us amongst those whom you have guided us. Uh, guided. So it is extremely important that the Muslim knows the path of those who precede it. So that you can be able to follow that path. Tayyip. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said, you can write this down, inshallah. A person's happiness in this life and the next is tied to the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
Therefore, it's an obligation for everyone who is true to himself and wants salvation and happiness for himself to know enough of the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam try to keep up huh? to know enough of the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that it removes him from the category of the ignorant and puts him in the category of the Prophet's followers and in other words you need to know enough of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his guidance that you are no longer considered to be amongst the ignorant you have to be, in order to be a true follower of the Prophet Sallallahu how can you be that if you don't know his way? Truly, how can you, how, literally you can't follow something that you don't know. It's like if somebody said, Make how do you do it? Right. How do you follow something and you don't know? Don't, you don't know that way. So learning about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu is very important. Uh, from Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala and then I want you to tell me how this shows us that the seerah is important you ready? Yeah. okay Allah Laka'i in his famous book Shara' Itiqad Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah he said that Imam Malik he mentions his isnad he died in 418 Imam Malik died in 179 so he mentions his isnad back to Imam Malik rahimahullah who said, كان السلف يعلمون أولادهم حب أبي بكر وعمر كما يعلمونهم السورة من القرآن. He said that the salaf used to teach their children the love of Abu Bakr and Umar. The way that they would teach them a surah from the Quran. How does this relate to the importance of knowing the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah. Tayyib, you have to know their lives. Yani the life of Abu Bakr and Umar. Radiallahu anhu. Tayyib, what's that have to do with the seerah? Yes. <laughs> Companions, especially those two, right, were very close to the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And they exemplified his character. Is that what you said? Tayyip, that's good, yes. Because they were the most beloved by the Prophet. Because they were the most beloved by the Prophet. Yeah, anybody else? Yes. They were guaranteed Jannah. Because of the relationship that they had with the Prophet. Because of the relationship that they had with the Prophet. All, all of that is true. But, but this, is, this is what I'm getting at. If that's how they would think they were with the life of the Prophet, right? If this is what. If this is how, and notice Imam Malik, who died in 179, after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ, he's, uh, between him and the Prophet ﷺ, are only two people. And he, his, his narration is usually, well not usually, but Nafi' and Ibn Umar, that the Prophet ﷺ did or said such and such, right? So he's only two generations removed. And from the Prophet ﷺ, if you look at it from that context, I mean, even though... Is more generations, but uh, the point is, he's not far that far removed. And he's saying that the Salaf, yani he's talking about the scholars who preceded him, right, would teach their children the love of Abu Bakr and Umar the way that they would teach them a surah from the Quran. If that's what they were teaching them about Abu Bakr and Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, then how much more so the love of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, in his life. Tay. Quick recap, inshallah, of what we covered last week. We mentioned that. The author, who is who again? Ibn Abil Iz, Ibn Abil Iz al Hanafi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And, and in general, Sirah, you can break it down into two broad categories. One is what the Prophet did in Mecca or before Hijrah, and then the other is what the Prophet did in Medina or after the Hijrah. The Meccan period is broken down into two categories. What is that? Before Revelation and? And after Revelation. We said that the author has mentioned 11 major events that happened before Revelation. We covered five of those events. 
The first of them was the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, which occurred when? The, during the year of the elephant. Okay. Uh-huh, keep going. On a Monday, on the 12th, it'll be al-awwal, inshallah. <laughs> Wallahu alam. Tell you. The second event was the death of the father of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his father's death. And that happened when? That happened before the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What I did forget to mention last week, inshallah, uh, you can write this down now, is the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's father, since we're mentioning his father, right? And we don't, I'm not going to go, you know, all the way back to Adnan and what are the Ibrahim, but I do think it's important for you to know some of the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It, it's important because as we get down, and, and we're not going to do this this particular time around, but this is only our first time that we're going to go through a book on the seerah of the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam. So we're going to do some other things later on down the line. But knowing how these, the, the other names that come up in the seerah, how they relate to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam becomes important. All right? So here, what I do want you to know is this. He is Muhammad Ibn Abdullah Ibn Abdul Muttalib Ibn Hashim Ibn Abdi Manaf. That part you should know to there, at least. And then if you add on to that Ibn Qusay, Ibn Kilab. Reason why going up to Kilab becomes important is because Kilab had two children, Qusay and Zahra. And the Prophet mother, Amina, uh, goes back to Kilab from the way of Zahra. Whereas his father goes back to Kilab by way of Qusay. So even his mother and father were you know, very distant cousins. Like fourth tier or something like that. طيب. So he's Muhammad ibn Abdullah, ibn Abdul Muttalib. Ibn Hashim, Ibn Abdi Manaf, Ibn Qusay, Ibn Kilab. And you can stop there, inshallah. And later on down the line, we'll add on to it. The third event was the suckling of the Prophet والسلام, And we mentioned that his wet, who were his wet nurses? Or who suckled the Prophet let, let, Number one, the one who gave birth to him. Amina bint Wahbin. Okay, his mother. She was the first one to suckle the Prophet ﷺ. Some of the narrations say for three days, some say for eight days. They say her milk was not coming very strong, right? And it was from the uh, Ada of the Arabs, that their, their norms, that they would send their children out anyway to uh, outside of the city to be nursed. Play it. So who was his wet nurse, the, the main one? Halima, Sa'diya. Who else? Thuwayba. Mawla or Mawla Lahab. She was the... Tayyip. Anybody else we mentioned? I did mention somebody else. Yeah, and that was a mistake. So I, I mentioned that Umm Ayman Barakah uh, bint Thalib al-Habashiyya that she was, that she suckled the Prophet ﷺ. But uh, upon further review in the books of the seerah, it appears that that opinion is not correct. It, she was no doubt caretaker of the Prophet ﷺ from the time he was born. But she did not suckle the Prophet ﷺ. And, and Barakah al-Habashiyya, uh, anybody know who, who she married? Yes. Uh, Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd ibn Haritha. Now, and they had a son named Usama. Usama bin Zayd. Right. Okay. And Zayd ibn Haritha was beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. He was the one who the Prophet ﷺ adopted, and they used to call him Zayd ibn Muhammad. Right. And that was before adoption became prohibited in Islam. طيب. So. Uh, Anyway, a lot can be said about Barakah, uh, Umm Ayman, Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha.
but this is a, a summarized version of the seerah. But her, her life story was amazing as well. She was the one who, after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Abu Bakr and Umar went to Anas. And they said, take us to, they said, take us to, to Umm Ayman. Because the Prophet Sallallahu used to visit her frequently. And so when they went to visit her, uh, she was crying. And they said, why are you crying? Don't you know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is in a better place? And so on and so forth. She said, I'm not crying because we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is in a better place. She said, I'm crying because revelation has ceded, ceased to exist. So she was crying because there's no more direct connection to revelation, subhanAllah. The fourth event was the splitting of the chest of the Prophet ﷺ. We read quite a bit of that. The fifth event was the death of the Prophet Sallallahu mother. And who was his mother? Write this down. Amina bint Wahbin ibn Abdi Manaf. Not the same Abdi Manaf as the other. Ibn Abdi Manaf ibn Zahra ibn Kilab. Right? So you see where her lineage meets with the lineage of Abdullah, the father of the Prophet. Right. We mentioned that she died. Returning from Al Medina. Why was she going to Medina in the first place? Hmm? No. Father. No. No. What's her brothers? No. Okay. Hey. Hey. Okay. Okay. So, so these are actually the maternal, so Benu and Najjar, okay, who were from Khazraj. So the, in Medina, they were two major tribes, right? Os and the Khazraj. They play a major role later on down the line in the life of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, after the Hijrah, right? But Benu and Najjar, Benu and Najjar, they were from the Khazraj. They were the maternal uncles of the Prophet Sallallahu grandfather, that is Abdul Muttalib. So they were his, Benu and Najjar were his paternal uncles, not hers. Okay? Play. Uh, turn to page 68 in the book that was sent to you, um, Sheikh Abdul Razak Sharh. Where did she die? She, she died in a place called Al Abwa, okay, which is between, is between Mecca and Medina. And her grave was known by the Prophet Alayhi Salatu was sitting. Like read, read at the end of page 68, where uh, it talks about him visiting the grave of his mother. From the Sunnah of the Prophet, which is gathered from this hadith, is to visit the graves because they remind you of the hereafter. Visit the graves because they remind you of the hereafter. You don't have to wait for somebody to die, right? Which is normally our practice. We go when somebody has died. Uh, so we pray Janazah and then we go to the grave. But going to the grave any other time is also from the sunnah of the Prophet and it reminds a person of where they're going and it puts things in perspective. Uh, you begin to prioritize things because you recognize that that is your destiny for everyone 
يعني كل نفس دائقة الموت طيب Any questions about what has preceded? Because we actually haven't started yet. We're almost done. Any questions before you proceed? Sorry? Any questions about what has preceded? The, we covered five events. So said the birth of the Prophet, والسلام, both of his parents' death, right? Uh, we covered the splitting of the chest of the Prophet, والسلام, who was wet nurses were. Tayyip. Today, inshallah, we're going to cover lines 10 through 19. Lines 10 through 19, bi'idnillahi ta'ala. Uh, I'm going to mention some things that you need to be aware of uh, because there's, um, there are two issues that need to be dealt with in lines 12 and in line 16. So do you have a poem in front of you? Tayyip. We'll read together, inshallah. Line 10 says, وَجَدُّهُ لِلْأَبِي عَبْدُ المطلب بَعْدَ ثَمَانٍ مَاتَ مِنْ غَيْرِ كَذِبٍ You see it? Huh. Yusuf. Okay. So, inshallah, um, after the class, for those who don't get the messages, there's a group on WhatsApp for this class. Join the group on WhatsApp so you can get all the materials, inshallah. ثم أبو طالب العم كفل ثم أبو طالب العم كفل. Notice طالب and then there's the the alif and the lam after, right? So طالب العم ثم أبو طالب العم كفل خدمته ثم إلى الشام رحل وذاك بعد عامه الثاني عشر. That's what it should say. وذاك بعد عامه الثاني عامه الثاني عشر. So the way that it's written now, which is وذاك بعد عام عام اثني عشر. That's that they call that the a broken a broken bait. Not a broken house, huh? The the bait here is the couplet, right? So every, every, the the line of poetry is broken because what do we what is this what is this called by the way what is this poetry what is this called al orjuza al miya and what is an orjuza in the first place what is that it's poetry written on a the meter of rajis which is mustafilun mustafilun mustafil right so it has to it has to flow so it's broken. If you if you say wadaka ba'da ami ithna yashar, it's broken. So the the senate that the author of this book uh, has, which actually goes through an interesting um so so Ibn Abil Iz he he actually gave Ijaza for this when he was after he wrote it, he gave it to uh Sheikh Shams, Muhammad ibn Muhammad al Maqdasi. He had a daughter, her name was Amatul Latif. Amatul Latif, that's the first time I heard that name. Amatul Latif, yeah. Bintu yani Muhammad. Yani Bintu Shams Muhammad ibn Muhammad al Maqdasi. So the, the, the isnads that people have today that go back to the author for this particular poetry go through her, through her father, right? And, and that's what they have. And that works. That, that follows the, the actual, that follows the pattern. Now, it doesn't change the meaning. So if you're just going through the English, leave it, leave it the way it is. That's what now, for those of you who study Arabic, normally that would be Khadija Ta, right? Because it's not a sarf. لأمنا خديجة متجرة وعاد فيه رابح مستبشرة فكان فيه عقده عليها وبعده إفضاؤه إليها وولده or وولده both of them work. وولده and وولده is the plural of walad. 
And what it is a child? It's not just a son, by the way. What is a child? وَوِلْدُهُ أَوْ وَوِلْدُهُ مِنْهَا خَلَاءِ بَرَاهِيمِ فَالْأَوَّلُ الْقَاسِمُ حَائِزُ التَّكْرِيمِ Yeah. Yeah. I know what it says. حَائِزُ that, that, That's the only... That, that's in some editions. That's what it is and that's what makes it work. Shaykh al-Usaymi, hafizahullah, he said, فَالْأَوَّلُ الْقَاسِمْ حَزَتْ تَكْرِيمِ And I, I'm not as smart as he is, so he might be right. But uh, the other editions that I've seen, it seems to work better. فَالْأَوَّلُ الْقَاسِمُ هَائِزُ التَّكْرِيمِ طيب, the rest is exactly as you see it. وَزَيْنَبُ 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 زاهي وقيل كل اسم لفرد زاهي والكل في حياته ذاك الحمام وبعده فاطمة بنصف عام and that's it and notice also فاطمة تون where normally it would be فاطمة تو because female names are ممنوع من الصرف طيب we got that all right the English, again, is going to read the same. Father, read the English for the entirety of it. 10, 10 through 19. And his paternal father, Abdul Muttalib, passed away while he was eight, no lie. Then his paternal uncle, Abdul Muttalib, took on his guardianship, and later to Asham, he traveled. That was while he was 12 years old. And the well-known incident with Bakhira, took place. The, man, the best of mankind again traveled to Hashem at the age of 25, remember it, as a traitor for our mother, Khadija. And he returned that year after profitable trade, happy. In that year was his marriage to her, and he later consummated his marriage with her. All his children were from her except Ibrahim. The first to earn that distinction was al Qasim. Then came Zainab, Ruqayya, Fatima, and Umm Kulthum, who was the last of the girls. And Allah did Al-Qayyib Abdullah. But some say each name belongs to a separate beautiful child. All of them tasted death during, during his lifetime, except Fatima, who died half a year after him. Right, so here we have, inshallah, uh, the 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th event that are mentioned, the 11th we'll cover next week, inshallah ta'ala, uh, right before we talk about Revelation, because then there's another series of events that the author is going to talk about. So if we go back, inshallah, to line 10. وَجَدُّهُ لِلْأَبِي عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ بَعْدَ ثَمَانٍ مَاتَ مِنْ غَيْرِ كَذِبِ We talked about, the last thing that we talked about was the death of the Prophet Sallallahu mother, who died when he was six years old and one month, according to the author. He then mentions that his paternal grandfather, father, Abdul Muttalib, so that's the father of Abdullah, right? That he died when the Prophet Sallallahu was only eight years old. And the reason why he's mentioning the death of Abdul Muttalib and, and why that's significant is because he was the one who became the guardian of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after Amina died. And he was so loved by Abdul Muttalib that he used to give him preference over his own children. This is his grandchild, right? But like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the only one that he would allow to sit on his carpet. The other children would be trying to get him to back up and don't, don't go too close because Abdul Muttalib was, you know, was revered uh, amongst, amongst his tribe, amongst the Arabs in general. But he loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so much and he took great care of him and, and he showed him that, you know, paternal love from the grandfather's standpoint. The thing was, he only lived for about two years after Amina. And so as he was, as he was dying, uh, and he recognized that he was dying, he, uh, 
advised his son Abu Talib, right, who was the uncle of the Prophet, right? Because this is his grandfather. His grandfather had children. One of his children was, was Abu Talib. And so he advised Abu Talib, or put, put the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam under the care of Abu Talib. So the reason why the author is mentioned in here is because Abdul Muttalib was actually the guardian of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for that two year time span, from the time he was six to the time he was eight. Now notice here, I think this is important for us to look at, and it'll come up later inshallah. But, but there's hikmah in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being an orphan, right? He never knew his father. His mother died when he was six. The next person in line, his grandfather, died when he was eight, right? But don't you think that this is one of the things that made the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have the empathy that he did for people, right? Because he himself, and he, he grew up without parents. So, so recognizing other people's struggles and being able to identify with those struggles is very important for a compassionate leader like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was. And it also, you know, put him in a place where sometimes people don't listen to other people because they say, you can't understand my pain. You can't understand what I'm going through. Well, that wasn't something they could say. Anybody could say to the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam to sit in. He lost his parents. And as you'll see as we go along, he lost all of his children. Except for Fatima, who's the only one that outlived the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam to sit in. He buried six of his children, right? So nobody can come say to the Prophet, you don't understand what I'm going through, right? A man I mean, who grew up without parents and who still persevered and was, and was patient with his circumstances and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decreed for him. And so for all of us, I mean, for the followers of the Prophet, knowing that and understanding that, and looking at how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with adversity is very, very important for us as his followers. The, the next event is covered in line 11. ثُمَّ أَبُوْ طَالِبِنِ الْعَمُ كَفَلْ خِدْمَتَهُ ثُمَّ إِلَى الشَّامِ رَحَلْ وَذَاكَ بَعْدَ عَامِهِ الثَّانِي عَشَرْ وَكَانَ مِنْ أَمْرِي بَحِيرَ مَشْتَهَرْ So here we have Abu Talib, the seventh thing is that Abu Talib became the guardian of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. And Abu Talib was his uncle. Uh, he was Abu Talib. Uh, we'll talk more about him in line 31, all right? That way we won't take up too much time now. He's going to come again because he died uh, in the ninth or tenth year after the revelation. And he was a major, major supporter of the Prophet ﷺ. But he never accepted Islam. He never accepted Islam. Now mind you, he went through all of the things that the Prophet ﷺ went through, including when the Prophet ﷺ was boycotted and everything else. He was part of, he was part of that. Because he truly did, and he cared for the Prophet ﷺ. And in fact, I mean, all indication is that he believed that he was a prophet. He knew that the Prophet ﷺ did not lie, not before revelation or after revelation. He knew that. So he knew that if the Prophet ﷺ said that he received revelation from Allah, that he received revelation from Allah. He knows that about the Prophet ﷺ. What do you think it was that kept him from saying, La ilaha illallah? He feared what his people would say. Wallahi, I'm, I'm telling you this because, subhanAllah, nobody, nobody, it, it doesn't matter how old you are. A lot of us think that, well, a lot of young people at least, we think that peer pressure stops when you get out of middle school and high school. But you could be 70 years old and still be worried about what your peers think. And that can stop progress. It can stop good from happening for your own life or for the other people's lives who you affect because you're worried about what somebody else is going to say. And that is why it is very, very important to surround yourself with good people 
and to be good to the people that you are surrounded by. There's two different things. Surrounding yourself with good people is one thing. Being good to those people who are around you is a different thing. And you need to do both. But being careful who you surround yourself with. In the, in the Hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, it, it details what happened at the death of Abu Talib. And that the Prophet Sallallahu went to him and he said, Ya Am, oh my uncle, say a word. Just say this statement. Something that I can use to argue on your behalf on Yom Al-Qiyam. The Prophet Sallallahu wasn't worried about anything else except this man's salvation. I mean, it just shows you how important it was to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that his uncle would say la ilaha illallah before he died. I mean, what benefit does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam get from that? Nothing. This man is dying. It's done. It's over. He gets nothing from that. But he's trying to get him to get to a point of salvation. Who's around him at the same time? Hmm? Abu Jahl and Abdullah ibn Umayyah. And they're saying to him, the Prophet is trying to get him to say, La ilaha illallah, they're on the other side. You're going to go back, you're going to leave the religion of Abdul Muttalib till his death. They're right there, peer pressure. Peer pressure. Till he's on his deathbed. You're going to leave the religion of Abdul Muttalib? And so the last thing that he said about himself is that he is ala millati Abdul Muttalib. And he died on that. And he didn't die on la ilaha illallah. Even though he believed. Huh? But he didn't witness. And so for those people, you know, because we live in a society where we're trying to invite people to a stand. And you can see, subhanAllah, this person believes everything I'm telling them. But if they don't witness, if they don't bear witness with their tongue, we can't treat them as Muslims. Wallahu musta'an. Wallahu musta'an. On that note, was shayb shayyuth kar. Be sure, especially for those of you who have non-Muslim relatives, be sure to get your affairs in order tonight and not wait till tomorrow. Seriously. Do what you have to do. Talk to who you have to talk to to make sure that if you die, that you are treated as a Muslim upon death. In the last 10 days, we've had to deal with two incidents of people who died and the next of kin is not Muslim and did not want them to be buried as Muslims. We have a situation right now. And inshallah, uh, you know when the janazah is shaking? Inshallah, all of you will be there. We'll let you know. But there's a young sister, subhanAllah. I don't think she was 21 years old. She accepted Islam. Was that last year, Sheikh? Last year. And, and, and married a young brother. But, and if you marry somebody, then your spouse is next of kin. Except for the fact that if you get married after 2005 in Philadelphia and you don't have a marriage license from the state, you just have the Islamic marriage, they don't count that as a legal marriage in the sense that that person becomes your next of kin. Before 2005 is a different story. Which means that what? Now, you, this sister accepted Islam. The rest of her family is not Muslim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called her back. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on her. But again, this was a situation where her next of kin did not want her to be buried as a Muslim. Alhamdulillah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned her heart. And bidnillah will be able to pray over her. But don't think that this is a an isolated incident. I'm saying personally we've dealt with in the last couple in the last ten days two incidents. Right. So 
get your affairs in order. Again, and here we have a situation where the Prophet وسلم, is trying to get his uncle to say la ilaha illallah on his deathbed. And we, and we see the results of having evil companions. People who, I mean, even if, subhanAllah, even if they seem to be people of good character and all that, how can a non-Muslim upon your death, what are they going to do? Tell you, they're going to do talqeen and shahada, they're going to say, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Why are you dying? Who are you around? Who is to say when you're going to die? Who do you want to be around you when you die? Really, like who do you want to be around you when you die? It, those are people you normally around or not. So who you take as a companion is very, very important. Or who you take as companions, very important. Like, uh, he then said that Abu Talib took the Prophet وسلم, to Sham. And Sham is, is Syria and the surrounding regions. Took the Prophet وسلم, to Sham for the first time. That was the first time the Prophet وسلم, went to Sham. The second time was when he was 25. He went to Sham and he met there a monk named Bahira. Okay? So the Prophet وسلم, went to Sham with Abu Talib at the age of 12. And, and this is a difficult journey, right? But it also shows you that Abu Talib, who, who, who cared deeply for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did not want to leave him in Mecca with anybody. He wanted to make sure that, that he stayed with him. But, but also what, what happens is that, you know, you take some, somebody 12, 13 years old at that particular age and they go on that journey with men. They learn a lot about manhood, right? Because it's not an easy journey. Um, there's no, you know, air conditions and plane and that type of stuff. I mean, they, they're traveling by land I mean, from Mecca all the way to Sham, which is, which is quite the journey. Taif, what happened when he met, met the Christian monk, Bahira? Turn to page 74 in your book. The explanation of Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr. Hafizahullah. You see it? Okay, go ahead, read that, inshallah. Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, said about this event, his uncle took him on a journey to Sham on business, while he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was 12 years old. And this illustrates his kindness towards him, due to the fact of not having anyone who could take care for him if he left him in Mecca. His uncle and those who traveled with him to Sham noticed signs in the Prophet وسلم, that increased his uncle taking care of him and having a stronger concern for him. As for al tirmidhi rahimahullah, relates in his Jahir with a chain of narrators, all of which are trustworthy, from the clouds providing shade for him وسلم, the trees leaning towards him, giving him shade, and the knowledgeable monk giving his uncle glad tidings that his nephew would become a prophet and ordered his uncle to return to Mecca so that the Jews would not see him and aspire evil towards him. Danny, yani what Bahira is talking about, he was, he was the, the, the monk at that particular time. Many of Ahlul Kitab, they believe that a prophet, based on their own knowledge of the book and their own studies, they knew that another prophet was coming. Uh, many of them did not know where that prophet would come from, but they believed that it would be during their lifetime, right? And so when he saw some of the things that were happening around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this was from the time he was young, right? even Halima, we talked about Halima Sa'diyah, she saw certain things from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she couldn't explain it, but she saw that he was blessed, right? to use a generic term. And so Bahira saw from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam certain things, and he told his uncle Abu Talib that he's special and that he believed that he would be, that he would be a prophet. He said that if the Jews, and, and according to some of the scholars, he was talking about the Jews of, of Shem, that if they saw him and they found out about him, that they may do to him as they did to previous prophets. 
from their own books, right, that they would kill some of their prophets. And so he was scared for the prophet Saul, son of him, so he told Abu Talib to take him back to where he came from so that he would be safe. Now this is what is mentioned about that first trip to Asham. And how old was he during that first trip? He was 12 years old. It then says, وَسَارَ نَحْوَ الشَّامِ أَشْرَفُ الْوَرَى فِي عَامِ خَمْسَةٍ وَعِشْرِينَ ذْكُرًا And then the best of mankind went to Sham at the age of 25. So remember. So the author jumps from the age of 12 to the age of 25. And there's not really much known about, you know, what happened exactly during that time period. Except that we know for a fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for a significant period of time was a shepherd. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talked about that later. And it comes in the books of authentic hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there was not any prophet except that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala had made them a shepherd at one point. And when you study the life of the shepherd, you see why it's so important for the prophets to have been shepherds. What does a shepherd do? Okay, so, right. So they take care of all of these sheep. And even the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned about each and every Muslim. Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun ar-ra'iyyatihi That every one of you is a shepherd and everyone will be asked about his flock. Okay, so... A shepherd has to be extremely patient, especially when you're talking about, let, let, let's not just talk about anywhere. You're talking about Mecca, which is hot year round, right? And so the shepherd is out dealing with the sheep, helping the sheep give birth when they have to give birth. The, the grazing of the sheep takes a long time. So it's not like they're just out there for an hour. They're out there for long periods of time. They have to protect those sheep from the wolves, Right? And what does a prophet do with his ummah? Teaches them what they need to know to protect them from shaitan. Right? And, and any other enemies and any other predators that may be out there. Also, sheep tend to be uh, not very smart. Hmm? They tend to be not very smart. So the shepherd has to make sure that the sheep is not just walking away going about his business, you know, like, like kind of just, um, we say, absent-minded. And you got to look out for him. Sheep have different, I don't know, person. The other ones, that, and, the, and the shepherd has to learn how to work with all of these different personalities, like a leader, right? That has to deal with all different kinds of people. And so the, that, the prophet saw his son's training with sheep, actually helped him later on in leading the ummah. And, he, and the Prophet Sallallahu dealt with people differently. You think about that man that came uh, very, very aggressive and, and, the, and, and, you know, he was with the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu didn't say anything to him. And then when he, and then when he left, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Bitsa akhul ashira. That man, is no, he's, he's not a good man. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and has said to him, well, you know, but, but when, when he was here, everything, you know, seemed like it was cool. And the Prophet sallallahu said, the worst of people is the one that you have to, uh, to jam iluhu, basically, ittiqa sharrihi. You, you, you got to like butter him up so that it doesn't cause you harm. Is that the person you want to be? The person that other people have to butter up because if they don't, and you're going to harm them, right? So, but the Prophet sallallahu knew how to deal with those kind of people too. You know, butter him up until he's out of it. It's, it's a bit right? But the Prophet Sallallahu knew how to deal with all of his people. But part of that was from that training of being a shepherd because it taught him patience, it taught him perseverance, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? It, it taught him how to look for tendencies. And so being, being a shepherd, not just that, compassion and mercy because these animals will harm themselves if you, if you let them. It's not going to bring any harm to you, but they'll harm themselves. And the Prophet had to be, as a shepherd, 
you think that none of the sheep die, so you have to be there as well to when, when, when they're going through those last moments. Subhanallah. So we know that somewhere between that time period of 12 to 25, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a shepherd, and that that had a a huge bearing on his personality, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it also shows that he wanted to contribute to the household. Meaning what? Abu Talib had a lot of mouths to feed. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was not his biological son, right? He was his nephew. And he didn't just sit there and wait to be fed, but he went out and he worked for, for some wages because the companions asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi oh, you used to be a shepherd? You were a shepherd? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, yes. I used to shepherd ala qararit li ahli Mecca. Yani, in other words, for some, he, he's mentioning what his wages were, which were not a lot. But this is what he did for the people of Mecca. And this was to help bring income to the household of Abu Talib, which shows the importance of working. Right. And not not just waiting to be fed and not just sitting on your back expecting, you know, that something is going to come to you because that breeds a whole different type of personality. Like, um, we moved a little slower today, Allah um, than, than I wanted to, but we finished the eighth event, uh, which is the Prophet Sallallahu traveling to Sham for the first time and meeting Bahira and what happened between the years of 12 and 25. We'll pick up uh, next week, inshallah, uh, on the 13th line, which is Wasara Nahwa Shami Ashrafu Wara. We'll pick that up uh, next time and we'll move a little. Uh, quicker through the text so that we can at least get to line 25 next week which is where I need you to memorize to for next week so line 25 if you need help if you need help with memorizing and for those of you not memorizing in Arabic that's fine read the English over and over and over and over again until it sticks just keep reading it so that you know the life of the Prophet Prophet because we're going to build on this for the next class, right? This is our first study of the seerah, and, and I meant what I said last week, which is that bi'idnillah, we'll be studying the seerah of the Prophet والسلام, until Allah Azza wa calls us back. Bi'idnillah. It is that important that we go over his life multiple, multiple times and extract the benefits. I mean, the, 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 there's a book, I need, a little over a hundred pages. It's just a day in the life of the Prophet, alayhi salatu was saying, right? A day in the life of the Prophet. What, what did his life look like from the time he woke up until the time he went to sleep, right? And, and that take, that'll take us 10 weeks, right? There's so many things that we can go over about the life of the Prophet, alayhi salatu was saying. Some of it will be rep repetitious, which is a good thing because repetition is a great teacher. And there's nobody, uh, nobody on planet Earth whose life we should be more concerned about than the life of our Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, and imitating his life, emulating him, alayhi salatu was salam, laqad kana lakum fi rasulillah uswatun hasan. We have the best example in the life of our Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadabullahu adam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ala nabina Muhammad. If there's any questions, you can put it, you can pose them to the admin of the group for this particular class. Um, you can see Adil, inshallah, to be added to the group uh, for, and it's, it's in the, the general sort of imagined, um, WhatsApp group, how, how you can join. Uh, but we don't have time for questions because I already went over. Wallahu musta'an. Inshallah, we'll meet back here next week, uh, 6 p.m. bi'idnillahi ta'ala. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdika, shalom, wa ilayhi 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 wa il